One of the reasons this community is so strong and growing is that we have so many capable leaders, so many of you out there put so much of yourself into this week after week. There's so much behind the scenes stuff that has to happen, even just to pull off a weekly gathering, much less all the other things that we're doing. Um, our main speaker today, the presenter of our main talk, is uh, one of our key leaders. He's a member of our board of directors. He's the head of the finance team, and just on top of that, a wonderful human being. Let's give a warm welcome to Eric Anderson. generous introduction. Uh, you know, one of the things that always impresses me so much every time I get up here, and I've been up here a few times before, although this is my first main talk, is just how much this community has grown. I think Mike alluded to it earlier, but there are so many new faces, new Oasians out in the audience today. It's a little bit intimidating, but uh, given the fact that all of you are here, I would like to give just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, like Mike said, my name is Eric Anderson. Uh, I'm a part of Oasis here with my wife, Jessica. Uh, we came to Oasis almost towards the beginning. Uh, we were here at the second meeting. I think there was maybe 10 or 15 people here. And that is a true testament to the strength of our community and the absolute incredible growth that we've experienced. Um, and uh, I think we've had the great privilege of having a number of talks kind of similar to this before. And uh, they usually go along the lines of my journey to free thought, right? We've all heard that. I propose one small critique that line because it is in my experience at least for me that free thought is not so much a destination that we have all arrived at but is an ongoing and continuing journey one I am still participating in right now I'd like to tell a brief story just to illustrate that point uh, it wasn't long ago I was invited to a neighborhood barbecue and one of the first things you do when you're invited to a neighborhood barbecue is you ask what can I bring well they said why don't you bring us some of your favorite beer and a little bit about myself, I grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado, a city that claims to have the highest number of breweries per capita of any city in the U.S., all right? So that's kind of our thing, and it's a little bit my thing. I would consider myself a beer snob. You know, over the last decade, there has been a huge pro proliferation of microbreweries in the U.S. and kind of this movement towards more complex beer outside of the uh, Bud Light and Coors Light that uh, our father, well, not my father, he was a Mormon, but your father's all drank, <laughs> right? So I thought, I'm going to bring a beer to these heathenistic Texans that's going to really impress them. I'm going to bring Blue Paddle. It's a new Belgian beer, one that I really enjoy. So I brought it to the, bar, to the party, and I proudly put it in the cooler, and I described it to everyone and was a total showman about it. And everybody tried it, and they hated it. It was disgusting. People would drink a little sip of it, and they got these weird looks on their faces. They put it on the counter, or they throw it away. And I was a little bit offended by this. Right? So I had a blue paddle, or two, or three, and I had something that beer often does. I had an epiphany. I realized I hated blue paddle, too. It's a disgusting beer. I can't recommend it to anybody. It is all bitterness, no body, and no taste. Sorry, New Belgium. I really do support that brewery, but blue paddle is not their best beer. <laughs> and I realized that my ongoing journey to free thought was not yet complete. The only reason I had drank Blue Paddle over all those years was to complete the image I like to see myself, not because I actually liked the beer. <laughs> this is a little bit of a funny example, but I think there are those of you out there, all of us, myself included, that still have our Blue Paddles that we're facing, our little biases that are maybe standing in the way of completing our journey to free thought. So this talk about my ongoing journey to free thought is really chapter one uh, in my quest to become a free thinker. And it's important you know a little bit about me that I grew up Mormon. I didn't only grow up Mormon, I had an all Mormon family. And not only an all Mormon family, I had an all Mormon extended family. Not only did I have an all Mormon extended family, I had all Mormon ancestors reaching all the way back to the time of Joseph Smith when the church was established. Yes, the Mormon church is very good at doing their genealogy, and I looked at my family tree, and I noticed the branches got a little bit thick about 150 years ago. That's because my ancestors were polygamists, 
They were so polygamous, in fact, that in 1862, when the Anti-Bigamy Act was signed into law by President Lincoln that outlawed polygamy in the U.S., they were on their way to Utah with the other Mormon pioneers. They immediately turned north, settled one mile across the Canadian border where polygamy had not yet been outlawed. Because they weren't about to break the law, right? But, you know, when I was doing this research, I was also curious, is there any other Anderson, or in this case, uh, Smith, because it was on my mother's side, um, who has ever questioned the Mormon faith before. I couldn't find anyone, but eventually I did find someone. Sylvester Smith, born in 1806, he was an inaugural president of the Quorum of the Seventy, which is the leadership body of the Mormon Church, my great-great-great-great-grandfather. He was known for his colorful confrontations with Joseph Smith, who is the founder and first president of the Mormon Church. So much so, that at one point, he threatened to kill Joseph Smith's dog if he did not get his way. Now, I wasn't able to find out what the confrontation was about. I could not condone animal abuse, and I cannot condone, even if it's Joseph Smith's dog, I can't condone it. But this is my ancestor. In fact, there's only one time in Mormon church history that a prophet has ever been investigated by a council of leadership church, uh, and that was in 1834 by my ancestor, Sylvester Smith. All Mormons who go through the required Mormon seminary are still to this day shown a video characterizing the many insubordinations of Sylvester Smith. So that's my ancestor. <laughs> Number two, to question the Mormon church in my family tree. Now believe me when I tell you that I came from a heavily Mormon background, as you just learned. In fact, when I was a Mormon, I occupied many leadership roles. Uh, of course, I was younger, so I was deacon's quorum president, teacher's quorum, priest quorum, uh, just different groups that go along with the young men. Mormonism was truly my life. I had almost exclusively Mormon friends, and I was very passionate and outspoken in defending my Mormon beliefs. And it was my outspokenness that actually began my journey to free thought. I was in a high school science class, and we were talking about evolution. And of course, I defended the church's stance against evolution, very passionately, so passionately so, that after class, my teacher, Joe Anastasia, pulled me aside. He didn't ridicule me. He didn't point out any of the flaws in my thinking. All he said was something that I'll never forget. He said, Eric, I think you'll find that the world is not so black and white. Things are almost always more complex than that. And that's something that really stuck to me. You know, at first I tried to brush it off, but it kept coming back. I found myself ruminating and thinking about it constantly. And the reason was, is because recognizing and exploring the complexities of things brought me closer to understanding the world than Mormonism ever did. Mormonism is a very black and white doctrine, and it is intentionally built to be simple like that. And allowing my natural inquisitiveness to think about the, the complexities of issues is what was so contagious about that idea. So I began to slowly let go of my mental blocks that have been installed in my mind. Whether this is intentional or not, every Mormon has mental blocks installed in their minds. They are taught the answers to common questions, verbatim, word by word. And if all else fails, they are taught to fall back on their testimony statement. And you'll find this out if you ever try and talk to a Mormon about their religion. You'll get so far and then you hit the final mental block, the testimony statement, and that's when it's shut off. There's no more good that can be done in talking to them. Well, these walls begin to melt away in my mind. And it's important that you know that the Mormon church strictly forbids outside research. And to help enforce this, my father monitored internet history at our home. Now, I had plenty of excuses to stay late at school. I could tell them I was doing cross-country or student council or uh, Young Republicans Club. <laughs> well, you think that's funny until you find out that I was the founder and president. But, uh, that's another story. <laughs> so I stayed late after school, and I researched on the school library computers. And I specifically did not want to go to anti-Mormon websites. I did not find them credible. I stuck to only sources that I could deem credible. 
And even with that restriction, it did not take me long to uncover the many scandals, contradictions, and inconsistencies with the Mormon religion. Now, I know Mike just said we don't bash religion. Please view this as a critique of the Mormon church and an integral part of the reasons why I left, which is important for you to understand in the context of this story. The Book of Abraham. Most people who know of the Mormon church, what do they think of? They think of the Book of Mormon, right? That is the main doctrine of the Mormon church by far. And I have here my old Mormon scriptures, see they have my name on it. The Mormons actually, a lot of people don't know this, they believe in the Old and New Testament. Selectively, but a lot of Christians do. The Book of Mormon, which you all know, the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a big long rule book, and the Pearl of Great Price, which often doesn't get mentioned. It is composed of the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mo Moses. Now at the time in the 1830s, in that part of America, uh, Palmyra, New York, there was something of a superstitious craze going on, and a lot of this revolved around Egyptology. Uh, this is before the Rosetta Stone was largely known, and Egyptian artifacts were kind of a hot item. So much so that there were traveling salesmen that would go around and sell Egyptian scrolls or artifacts or pieces of mummies or whatnot, because they were almost a tradable commodity in that time. And it was from one of these traveling salesmen that Joseph Smith bought the scroll from which he proclaimed, I am going to translate this. God has told me this is the lost book of Abraham from the Bible, and I am going to translate it for all of you to read. And a very similar method to how he claims to have translated the Book of Mormon. Well, unlike the Book of Mormon, the scroll for the Book of Abraham is still around. And we have the Rosetta Stone. So we can now actually take this to an Egyptologist and have them translate it for us to check Joseph Smith's claims that he was translating it. And what is even more offensive about the whole thing is the Mormons actually print excerpts from the scroll right in the Book of Mormon. We could, in theory, take this to an Egyptologist today, and he or she could tell us whether or not these matched this. And they would say no. So in my mind, the case is closed. There's no further discussion to be had. Joseph Smith was a liar. At best, he was delusional. At worst, he was a con man. And the reasoning goes on. You know, he was a, a poor farm boy uh, in the 1830s. He probably didn't come into contact or was aware of the properties of gold. But that didn't stop him from making a claim that he translated the Book of Mormon from golden plates. And he was very specific about the dimensions and makeup of it. Well, knowing the properties of gold, we know that gold of those dimensions would weigh 200 pounds. That's a problem. Joseph Smith used to carry the plates around in a wooden box under his shoulder. He would, there are paintings of him holding them out like this. He was not superhuman strength, all right? This wasn't Hulk Hogan, okay? The Mormon church has tried to refute that claim by saying, well, it was a gold alloy mix, maybe, right? Even under the most generous of circumstances, they still would have weighed in excess of 80 pounds, leaving us with the same problem. Furthermore, the Book of Mormon makes the claim that um, all Native Americans are descendants of a family that traveled here from Jerusalem. Well, modern DNA evidence has shown us that Native Americans are not of Middle Eastern descent. They are of Asian descent, which lends to the prevailing theory right now that they traveled across the ice bridge many thousands of years ago. Furthermore, the Book of Mormon makes the claim, it's, it's, it's very, if you ever read it, and I can't recommend it, it's actually kind of boring. And boring. <laughs> but it's very good about not disclosing the locations of things, except for one event. The final battle of the Book of Mormon supposedly takes place at the base of the Hill Cumorah in New York, where Joseph Smith claims to have found the golden plates. Many excavations have been done, and the Book of Mormon, by the way, talks about uh, iron shields and iron swords and artifacts which would preserve for a very long time. Excavations have been done. Not a shred of evidence has ever been found at this supposed battle site. So imagine my confliction when I discovered these things. Now, beyond just discovering these things, I was actually had a little bit of a deadline on making up my mind. I was soon turning 19 and would be required to serve a two-year Mormon mission. So I, at this point, had come to the conclusion that the church was false, but I still know that the cost of leaving the Mormon church would be very great and was unsure if I could do it or not. And there was a deadline. I had to leave on my Mormon mission soon. I had to make up my mind soon. 
Well, it just so happens that one day, a good Mormon friend of mine, Kyle, confided in me his doubts that he was going through the same thing. He said, Eric, have you ever thought that our church might not be true? I have to tell you, that took an enormous weight off my shoulders. I had been bottling up all that I had learned up until this point, terrified to tell anybody about it, and I commend Kyle's courage in talking to me about that. In fact, it was therapeutic for us to talk about it and all the things we had learned, and we came up with a plan that would buy us a little bit more time. We told our parents that we wanted to get some school done before we went on our missions, which is an acceptable and pragmatic moral thing to do. So I moved out and I started attending CSU. And I knew that extended the deadline, but I still had to come clean to my parents. I waited the longest to tell my mom. I told my dad first and I made him promise not to tell her because I knew it would be hardest on her. And I was right. And watching her cry and beg for me to come back to the Mormon church left me with the realization that my life is not only my own. The decisions I make have strong moral implications beyond myself. The hardest part of leaving the Mormon church is not the fact that you are abandoning your upbringing or your religion. I naively thought it would be a battle of me against Mormonism. What it turned out to be was a battle of me against my parents. Of the total cost paid for leaving the Mormon church, a significant portion was paid by my parents, who I know for a fact were mocked, looked down upon, and belittled because of the decision that I made. I was soon cut off financially, and it was difficult to make ends meet. I had a job, but when it wasn't enough, I took a second job. When that wasn't enough, I dropped out of school. And that wasn't enough, I started selling what I had to make ends meet. Now, I worked in sales. Both my jobs were in sales jobs. My first one was um, in buying and selling used electronic equipment for an e-recycler. My second job was uh, selling newspapers over uh, as a telemarketer. Uh, for all the kids in the audience, newspapers are like an offline <laughs> In the blizzard of 2006, it got bad. All of my shipments at my primary job were snowed in and subsequently delayed. I would have to go without a paycheck for three months. It got so bad, at one point all I had left was my guitar and a handful of change. I sold the guitar to pay rent. I counted out the handful of change and budgeted for myself two packages of ramen a day. In the morning, I'd wake up early, make my first packet of ramen. I had long ago sold my car, so I'd take the bus, or the bus to my first job. <clears throat> then, in the evening, I would take the bus to my second job and work late as a telemarketer. When I finally got off, it was so late that the buses weren't running. So I would walk from downtown to my home. It took about over an hour each night regardless of the time of year, or the weather, or whether it was raining or snowing. And it was on one of these nights, while I was walking home, I walked the final corner around where I could see my house in the distance, and I could see that Kyle was waiting for me. He'd been there as my support structure, but I had been so focused on working and keeping myself fed, I had left Kyle to fight his own battles. He told me he couldn't do it anymore, his mom was very sick. He was convinced that the stress he was putting on her was killing her. He had made up his mind, and he was going back. Cut off from my family, I was friendless, and I was godless. I was alone in a way that I have never been before. In the past, I had always relied on God, but as a new atheist, I no longer had that crutch. And I came to the realization that a transition to reason requires a transition to emotional and mental self-reliance. It was hard, but in the end, things gradually improved. My sales commissions picked up. I re-enlisted at CSU. I even had enough money to buy a car. And most importantly, I made friends. 
One challenge was adjusting to my post-Mormon, or rather finding my post-Mormon self. The Mormon church had so many rules, I feel it occupied or prevented the development of my personality. I had to learn how to swear. <laughs> Which is an underappreciated art. <laughs> if you swear too much, you sound like you're uneducated. If you swear too little, you sound like you're childish. But if you swear just right, at exactly the right times, you can embellish any fucking point. <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> also, I had to catch up on rated R movies. Not a lot of people know this, but Mormons are not allowed to watch rated R movies. There were so many movies, I was trying to make friends, and then I said, oh, have you seen The Matrix? Have you seen this? I have to go, no, I haven't seen that yet. So I spent a good two years with a Netflix subscription, catching up on every major rated R movie that I hadn't seen. And in the end, I decided I should have my first drink. It was a whiskey sour. I remember one of my friends came over and made it for me. I specially requested, told him, called him on the phone and said, I think I want a drink. <laughs> I'm ready. So he came over and he made me a whiskey sour and I was having second thoughts. And I lied to him. I said, I've got to go to the bathroom. Took the drink with me, I went up to my room and I sat it on the, the night side table and I just stared at it. And I thought about all the things I've been taught my whole life about alcohol. And drinking alcohol, you were giving your body and your mind over to the devil. And I did not know what was going to happen when I drank it. I eventually did drink it, and uh, I have since enjoyed alcohol responsibly. I even tried a cigar at one point, but I do not recommend that. I felt pretty cool smoking that cigar, but I didn't feel very cool the next two hours throwing up. So I got over that. Another thing I really enjoy and I've discovered about myself is I love coffee. Mormons are not allowed to drink caffeine, so I definitely had to pace myself in the beginning to build up the tolerance to it. And the first few coffee drinks I ever had were more cream and sugar than coffee, but I've gotten to the point now where I really love and enjoy black coffee. And then most importantly, I had to learn to fill the time on Sunday. Mormons have three-hour church. Plus, depending on your calling, you usually have another hour's meeting. That's four hours of church. And then you're forbidden or prohibited from doing anything else but personal study for the rest of the day. I had never had a Sunday off in my entire life. It was great. Now, my weekends are twice as long, and I still haven't completely acclimated to it. They still feel like they're longer than they should be, but I'm sure at some point I'll get over that. Most importantly, I've begun to make inroads in redeveloping my relationship with my family. There will always be an unspoken distance between us, but it's important that we focus on what we have in common, rather than our differences. Ultimately, I try and make decisions through reason. And remember that the world is not so black and white. Things are almost always more complex than that. Thank you. We've got some time for a Q&A. Are there any questions? Please. Yeah, so uh, you said when you're in discussions with a Mormon, you always reach like this block. Mm -hmm. And uh, what have you found maybe a way of helping reach past or help start to, to like working down a block right now? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I always thought that like it, when I was first discovering these things about the Mormon church, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to tell my parents this. They don't know. Look at all this evidence against Mormon religion, right? But, you know, it doesn't work that way. You talk, you talk to people and, and they already have their kind of uh, pre-subscribed answers to everything. Um, I have not successfully gotten around the block. I think the closest I've ever come is asking the hypothetical question, is there an amount of evidence that would convince you the Mormon church is false? Because at least then they have to admit that there's not and the discussion's over. And if there is, well, you could probably find it for them. Yes? What became of your friend, Kyle? Uh, Kyle and I are actually still friends now. Um, he is a very smart kid. He's pre-med right now studying. He went and served a two-year mission in San Antonio. Uh, he's married. I participated in the wedding. And I think I'm very fortunate uh, to have him as a friend still. Yeah? Okay, so at 19 is when you started to question. 18. 19 is when you're supposed to go on your mission, so. How old are you now? I'm 26. Yes. Well, 
what percentage do you think of the Mormon population is experiencing anything like what you experience in terms of doubts? I want to repeat that question. Uh, the question was, what portion of the Mormon population do you suspect is experiencing the same type of thing that I went through of doubts in the religion? Uh, it's really difficult to say. Uh, Mormon, uh, the, the Mormon church is known for not disclosing full records on who they're inactive or, and they keep everybody on their full records even if they are inactive. Um, Johnny and Kelly, do you maybe have speculation on that? Uh, they're, they're very well researched on that. They've, they've got 15 million members that they like to claim, um, but of that, if you look at third world countries or, or even more developed countries, that uh, Brazil, Mexico, mm -hmm. what they report versus what the census reports, they off by a factor of 10. So wow. as far as what the actual <clears throat> self identify as Mormons, uh, I, I couldn't tell you what the number is, but it is significantly less than 15 million. Wow, and, and, and when you think about it, 15 million is a drop in the hat, you know, stacking up against other major religions like uh, Catholicism and Evangelicals. 15 million worldwide is almost nothing. And if it's even significantly less than that, I mean, it's amazing that the Mormons have uh, grabbed such attention in the religious community. Dennis. Another question about your friend Kyle. He is the one who approached you with his doubts, so they must have been pretty genuine. Then, for familial reasons, he went back to the church, not because he lost his doubts, mm -hmm. right? And then he goes on this mission, and <clears throat> where is he now? Is he living a fake Mormon life, or what? Um, I'm not sure if Kyle has cognitive dissonance, or um, if he has fully reaccepted the, the Mormon church and simply taken it on faith, so to speak. Um, I remember that um, before Kyle left on his mission, I did have a chance to meet with him again. Or, I'm sorry, no, it was after he came back on his mission. I saw him again for the first time, and he tried to give me the Mormon speech to get me to come back. <laughs> so I am convinced that he um, is a true believer in the faith. Yeah, there's, um, yeah the, the, uh, something called a Concord fallacy, or the, the sunk cost. Mm -hmm. where a lot of people will fall into that logical fallacy. I've invested so much time, so much energy, I can't leave it now, you know, I would be ostracized, and that fear overrides. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is a well-known human fallacy, the sunk cost fallacy. One of the first things you learn when you take an accounting, an accounting class is to ignore sunk costs. It's irrational to account for that. Right. Yes? Um, so I'm, I'm not a book of Mormon scholar by any chance, but uh, maybe clarify something that I've heard. Uh, my understanding is that some of the uh, criticisms that have been given to the Book of Mormon is that Joseph Smith might have plagiarized two other books. In your search, did you ever heard anything like that? I have heard that claim, yes. Um, there, there, uh, I, I'm not uh, completely familiar with it. I have read a little bit about it. But there is the claim that Joseph Smith plagiarized a good part of the Book of Mormon. Um, I don't remember the name of the book, but it was a book that looks like uh, Johnny knows the name. Do you know the name, Johnny? Uh, there was a Spalding manuscript was a fiction work that, that it, there's a lot of resemblance to, and then mm -hmm. there was a, um, another book uh, by uh, Ethan Smith, no relation, called um, uh, View of the Hebrews, mm -hmm. that uh, goes through a lot of the same ideas of the, uh, the Native Americans being uh, lost track of Israel. There you go. So and then there's the Bible. Then there's the Bible. Yeah, there's always that. Well, uh, you had your hand up for a long time. I'm sorry for not calling on you oh, earlier. No, that's fine. I just wanted you to know that you just repeated our history. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. Are, are, you, are you a former Mormon? Oh, yes. Wow. Both of us. And we had the same doubts that you had. Mm -hmm. And in order to satisfy those doubts, he got married instead of going on the mission. Okay. Woo woo woo! Three years of wedded bliss, 48 years of marriage. But the other point that I wanted to kind of bring out is, and I agree with 100% of what you said, the research and everything, the two things that are really good in the Mormon church that a lot of people can take a uh, uh, page out of the book is the family relationships are just and we had had to go through that same family thing with his folks my folks were a whole different story but mm -hmm. and, the, and the welfare system if the u.s government would take a look at the mormon welfare system and do something similar we'd be in a lot better shape 
You know, I'm actually I'm glad you brought that up because um, this concept, even the Mormon church too, is not so black and white. There are laudable things about the Mormon church. They have very close family structure uh, and they do a lot of great welfare work. So, you know, uh, especially anti-Mormons, we love, I, I, I don't consider myself an anti-Mormon, post-Mormons, we love to characterize the church as this big, evil, you know, faceless, whatever, right? But we have to admit that religions still do uh, good things. In fact, part of that is why we're here today. The community that was largely established by religions is something that we want to emanate. And, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more question. Who had their hand up the longest? That was you? All right, you. Um, so, you talked about your journey of free thought. And I'm, I'm curious how you got from being a Mormon to now being an atheist. There's a lot that, there's a lot of stops you could have stopped on yeah. before that. You, you could have went to another religion, had the agnostic, which you did. So you went from it's, it, from your speech, it seemed like you went straight from Mormon to, I don't really got it all. Pretty much, so, yeah. <laughs> which, which is fine, but I'm just, I'm, I just like to understand. Yeah, yeah, no, it's totally. It's, it's completely a fair question. It's actually something that's kind of unique to Mormonism. I think a lot of people that um, leave other Christian denominations, whether or not you consider Mormonism a Christian denomination, I don't really care. But um, other people that leave other denominations, sometimes you know they'll they'll stop at just more liberal versions of it or whatnot, and that's comfortable with them. Um, Mormonism actually does a really good job in teaching you all the flaws of every other religion. <laughs> a really good job. Even when I was a Mormon, I was completely convinced every other religion on earth was false. All I needed was one more. All right, I got that one more. I'm an atheist. All right, I, I understand we are now out of time. Thank you so much. I will be at lunch today if anybody has any further questions.